And the last one. Uh, okay, so uh, so what I'm going to do today is uh, I'm going to explain. So historically, quiver varieties were discovered by Nakajima, not for the purposes of representation theory at all, but as an output of his work with Kronheimer on instantons. And uh, so I am going to explain at least uh, an algebraic version of this connection. And then uh, I explain, well, mention the standard application to representation theory and talk about this a little bit. All right, so uh, let me first uh, remind you some sort of elaborate notation that I used introduced so far. So Q is a quiver, just anything, uh, with vertex set. I. And then we sort of enhanced it in two ways. So first of all, we introduced a new quiver, which is called a framed quiver. Uh, for Q, and then they also took the double of that framed quiver. So uh, this is, uh, well, it doesn't have, it has two adjectives attached to it. It's double of frame. So if this is a, uh, uh, the original quiver with some arrows, uh, then the double has uh, arrows in the opposite, reverse arrows, and this prime has additional vertices, one for each old vertex, and then also uh, this frame quiver has uh, one edge between each vertex and its partner, and the double of that also has an edge in the opposite direction, so the edges here are x and x star. And the edges here is the one which is incoming to the old vertex is i, and which is outgoing from that old vertex is j. So, so a, point in, uh, a point in rep uh, uh, q prime bar vw, so where the v spaces are those at the bottom level and the w spaces are those at the top level, so a point here is a quadruple, x, x star, uh, i, j, of linear maps, where x's are the maps uh, between the vector spaces v, uh, x stars are just reversed maps, i are the maps from w's to v's, and j are the maps from v's to w's. So uh, maybe I should list this down. So x is a certain map from some v i uh, to v j, then x star, is a map from Vj uh, to Vi. So I, well, this is not, as I explained, this is not on this column. It's Nakajima's notation. I can change it. So this is a map from uh, Wi uh, to Vi. And this is a map uh, from uh, Vi to Wi. And so we have lots of vertices and edges, and uh, we have lots of such maps. Uh, and so also we have uh, to define this uh, quiver variety of Nakajima, we need to specify a parameter, which is an i-tuple of complex numbers. So we have lambda, which is an i-tuple of complex numbers. So i and i. So this is a point in c to the i. Uh, and associated to this point, we have a, 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 a collection of scalar matrices. So L uh, lambda I times identity VI. And so this guy lives in uh, GL of VI. And so altogether, this gives me a point in uh, lambda. So all this uh, together for all I's gives me a point lambda, uh, which is just this, in, uh, in the direct sum of these guys, which is uh, by definition denoted by G sub V. And finally, uh, Nakajima variety, uh, M sub lambda VW is defined as you take the fiber of the moment map mu uh, over the point lambda. Then you take uh, the double slash quotient, but with respect to a stability condition, uh, chi, mm, by the action of the group G sub V, which is the, so G sub V is just the product of, the G, of GLs. 
And uh, uh, the stability condition, so last time I explained, I, we discussed the general stability condition, that, but at some point I said, so, and from now on I will only use this one, is the one which is just the product of all determinants. So chi is a map uh, homomorphism from G sub V to, to C star, which takes an I tuple of uh, invertible matrices and sends it to just the product of their determinants. Okay, now everything is, uh, all the symbols are defined on the board. So now I will uh, explain, uh, discuss uh, uh, several examples in increasing sort of complexity and generality. Hmm? Uh, you mean here? Uh, yes and no. Uh, for instance, uh, yeah, maybe there's a good point here, uh, but it, and if I say it in general, this is impossible to understand the meaning of it. So I will explain it, remind me in, in two minutes, and I will explain it on the example. This is an important point, but uh, it's basically something about G, general GIT, but it's very convincing in, a, in an example. So uh, actually, I didn't know it uh, some 15 years ago, and then therefore I wrote, wrote a wrong paper because I didn't know that problem. And this problem somehow appears in representation theory of GLN indefinitely many times. So, uh, okay, so, uh, so let's start with our basic example, uh, the Jordan quiver. Uh, so this is just one loop and one edge. So this is x. Uh, okay, so now the, the double, uh, we know what the double is, but let's start with q prime. So this is my q, uh, q prime. So what we are supposed to do, we're supposed to, uh, uh, to take a vertex, take a partner with that vertex, a new vertex, and connect them by an edge. So this is what uh, Q prime is, okay? And uh, so the double of that, so by the way, this is I think called Kalogero-Moser quiver, or, well, never mind. So, uh, so Q prime bar, so you have to double everything on the board before, so you have two loops. So this is X, this is X star. And also you now have two edges, one in, incoming edge, I, and an outgoing edge, J. And there's a vertex here, and there's a vertex here. And so there's a vector space. In a representation of a representation such gadget, it's just a linear map for each of these arrows, and uh, one vector space put at this vertex, and another vector space put at, at this vertex. So let's assume that... Uh, so uh, look at the most uh, basic case. So let's assume that the dimension of V is N and the dimension of W is just one. So W is just C. Okay, so I, if I, so my, my, okay, let me explain a little bit about the plan. So I have, I, I planned to give uh, an elab, uh, to work out this example in detail and I will hopefully to have time to do it at the end, but then I, I'm afraid I won't get to some interesting point that I would, which is kind of still an open conjecture, which I don't want to put at the very end, so let me discuss that in, in the middle at least, and if I have time, I'll go back to, to this. Uh, right, okay, so now let me just make a statement. Yeah, so in general before, let me put it here. So I remind you that, uh, so I, I define this Nakajima variety, M lambda uh, VW, as there, but I also have a variety which is all these symbols are there, except that there's also a bar on top of all of this, which is exact same thing, except that this chi becomes zero. So this is just a categorical quotient. Uh, so this is this new inverse of lambda double slash uh, GV with, without any uh, chi's in it. Uh, so this is an affine variety, so this is smooth. Uh, this is affine, but possibly singular, and they're related by a projective map, projective morphism, which is denoted by pi, which comes automatically whenever we have a JAT quotient and the categorical quotient, you have such a thing. So this is a projective morphism. Uh, and so uh, in, in all these examples, it's useful to look at both M and M bar. So that's why I uh, discuss it. So, uh, so first of all, uh, so in this case, so what is M bar? 
of, of this. So I'll just write, uh, okay, so m bar uh, zero, I will, let me take parameter zero for now. So, well, in our case, uh, the parameter is just one complex number, and in fact, the only thing that matters is whether it's zero or not zero. Otherwise, the varieties are isomorphic, so let's discuss only the zero case for, to save time. So then uh, the claim is that uh, this is just the, the thing we already have seen before, namely it's the, the nth symmetric power, where n is the dimension of, of this guy, of C2. Okay? And the point, uh, the only point I should probably explain here is that the moment map equation that we're talking about uh, has the following form, which I just, I rem we, we had it, have seen it uh, many times before. So this is just the commutator x, x star uh, plus ij. Uh, so uh, what we are supposed to do to define this, we are supposed to take the zero fiber of this equation and mod out categorically by the action of g. But the, the point is that if you uh, take, so when you take a categorical quotient, this means that you take closed orbits. Not just all orbits, but closed orbits. But if you look carefully, you will see that if you have an equation, this is equal to zero, and you take a closed orbit, this automatically implies that both i and j are zero, just by, because there is a rescaling which pre prevents the orbit to be closed otherwise. And so then, actually, if you look at closed orbits, then this term plays no role because it has to be zero. And then you go back to the equation there, you just say two matrices commute. In that case, we discussed last time. So in this, there's no difference, and that's why you get this answer. Uh, now, if you look at uh, the same thing without a bar, so uh, you look at the same thing, uh, so I, I'll just be in W the same, then this is, uh, so according to this picture, it's supposed to be something smooth, and this is the Hilbert scheme of n points on C2. So if I, again, if I have time, I'll work it out. Uh, and again, uh, well, let me just put it, and the morphism from M naught uh, to this M bar is a classical thing. It's called a, a Hilbert Chow morphism. Okay, so that's all I want to say at the moment about uh, this, uh, this particular Hilbert scheme. Now I want to sort of uh, generalize this further and further. Uh, okay, this is all proof. Right, so now it's time to go to the Mackay correspondence. So let me uh, remind you the Mackay correspondence. Uh, so, uh, so in the Mackay correspondence, the input data is a finite subgroup gamma in SL2C. And we take our vertex set I to be the set of all fi irreducible finite dimensional representations of this group. And if I have a vertex I here, I will denote a corresponding irreducible by L sub i. All right, and so I remind you how do you define, the, so there's a graph associated to, to this data, which is called, which is what is called the Mackay correspondence, uh, and which was discovered by Mackay. So the vertices are, as I said, and so we have to define the adjacency numbers between uh, vertices, and so you write Eij, so this is the number of edges from I to J. Uh, maybe I should. So this is by definition the number of edges from I to J. And you define it to be an intertwiner, some intertwining number. So the dimension of home uh, of gamma representations from Li to Lj tends are uh, the two-dimensional tautological representation, which comes from the fact that gamma sits inside SL2C. So it does act on C2, that's the logical. Uh, now, an important point to observe is that uh, 
Yes, so this gives me, so the collection of, uh, so if I take your, your reps of gamma uh, as vertices as, and uh, these EIJs as adjacency matrix, so then this data produces me a quiver, which is, let's denote it by Q gamma, uh, which is called the Mackay quiver associated to, uh, to this gamma. Uh, now, an important point to observe here is that, uh, which will sort of contradict all the previous notation, is that this quiver is symmetric. So the number of arrows from I to J is equal to the number of arrows from J to I, which is a consequence of the fact that C2 is a self-dual representation of SL2. It's isomorphic to its own dual, and therefore it's self-dual for every subgroup of SL2. And so you can move this C2 to this part, and this gives the symmetry. So in fact, the Mackay quiver, you can think of it as a double, as the double of some other of its half. It doesn't matter how you choose this half, but it's already the double. And so this will play the role of bar. So there will be no bar because this is already a bar. <laughs> okay, so, it's, so this Q gamma, gamma is not an analog of Q, it's an analog of Q bar. One has to remember this, otherwise it's confusing. Uh, all right, so, uh, good. Uh, so, so here is my, so this is my uh, Q gamma, which is supposed to be this Q bar. Now we're supposed to construct, the, put the prime to, on top of all this. So we're supposed to add. Uh, Sorry, but are you taking multiplicity No, the multiplicity from I, to, well, this is, well, it's adjacency. By adjacency, I mean, I don't know, maybe that's the wrong name. It's the number of oriented edges. So if you forget the orientation, it will be even, yeah, but, uh, right. So now, uh, well, so if you put Q prime, so we have to add uh, each, uh, a new vertices to each one, but I will only be interested at the moment at a very special case, namely among the vertices of this Q gamma, there is a distinguished one, which corresponds to the trivial representation, and it's usually denoted by naught. So this is a, so inside here, there is a special vertex zero. Yeah, and I, of course I should have said this, and the whole point of the Mackay correspondence is to observe that the, the graphs which, you show, which show up under this are precisely the, the affine linking graphs. So this is what this whole business about the Mackay correspondence is. But in any case, there's a vertex that corresponds to the trivial representation, one-dimensional representation. So this plays a distinguished role. Uh, and uh, so I will be, yes, and so I will take the following, uh, uh, so to specify a representation of my Q prime, so there will be a bunch of vertices, uh, but I will take a very special dimensions everywhere, namely at the vertex I, I put a vector space uh, which is just the irreducible itself, uh, but as a vector space, you completely forget uh, the action. Uh, so in particular, uh, the irreducible hell has dimension one, and by the way, the dimensions of these irreducibles are called exponents of the Dinkin diagram. Uh, so uh, whatever, uh, but I just put this. Uh, so these are my VIs in the graph. And the Ws are put in, even in a simpler way. I put a one-dimensional space. So I'm mimicking the Hilbert scheme construction here. So I'm, I'm putting a one-dimensional space at this vertex, which is the one which is a partner of zero. And uh, I will denote it by infinity. It's a customary now to denote it by infinity. And there will be other, of course, partners to other vertices, but I just put zero dimensions here. So, so I can really forget about them because uh, zero space with zero arrows is, plays no role. So there will be basically no other vertices. So this should be thought of as a sort of partner of this quiver. So uh, as usual, people know that uh, a loop uh, with one edge is, there's no analog of uh, Dinkin diagram of type A naught but there is an analog of Dinkin diagram of type A affine node, and this is what it is. So uh, I am sort of extending from node to other affine Dinkin diagrams, and then I am supposed to do this. What? Okay, uh, all right. And so now uh, a basic uh, result which uh, led, leads to Nakajima varieties is a known result by Hrnheimer. Uh, well, in the double, yeah, so this is, everything is doubled, so, yeah, so there's one G I and one, one J and Y I, and that's it, that's the whole picture. 
Okay, and the, so the theorem of, uh, yeah, the theorem on, of Kronheimer, I think this was actually his PhD. Uh, was the following. Well, he stated it in a slightly different way, but it doesn't matter. So let me uh, collect, denote all this collection of Li's, but just by L. So this is my V. This is a collection of all these spaces. So then uh, the first statement of the theorem is that if you take the space over 0 with parameter 0 uh, of this L one-dimensional space at infinity vertex, uh, and put the bar to this, uh, then you get uh, this space turns out to be uh, a two-dimensional surface, which is isomorphic to the quotient of C2 mod gamma. Acting on C2, it tautologically, well, since it's a subgroup of SL2C. Okay? So, uh, moreover, uh, there is no, uh, we can do the same uh, we can look at m lambda, uh, same thing, without a bar, which is a smooth quiver variety. And the claim is that, uh, so first of all, we have to figure out where does lambda live. Uh, so lambda lives in, uh, in uh, so lambda is an i-tuple of complex numbers. So lambda sits in uh, c to the i. And uh, from the point of view of Dinkin diagrams, this is the Cartan subalgebra of the affine Dinkin diagram, right? Uh, but in fact, uh, in one direction, namely in the not direction, we cannot, if we put a uh, non-zero number in the not direction, then the, equa the equations will never have a solution for the same reason that the trace of commutators is, has to be zero. So in fact, the only way we can uh, uh, get something non-empty is to take lambda to have one coordinate zero. So in fact, uh, we have to take a subspace uh, c to the i minus this not vertex. And then it be, it's identified with a Cartan subalgebra of the finite Dinkin diagram. And so you have a family of smooth varieties uh, over this base, the Cartan subalgebra. And the fact is that this is a universal deformation or what's called universal unfolding. Uh, of this uh, Kleinian singularity, which has is known classically to have exactly this many parameters. So this is universal. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, the bar, let's put the bar first. So this is uh, still with the bar. Universal deformation of, uh, of C2, C2 mod gamma. And finally, uh, three, uh, which is probably the most important one, that uh, if we consider the non-barred version, and the map pi from the non-bar to bar, then this is a uh, the minimal resolution of singularities of whatever this is. So this is a, the minimal. For surfaces, they, it makes sense to consider the, there is a minimal. Among all resolutions, there's a minimal one. So it also has dimension two, but it's smooth. So maybe uh, just if you haven't seen it before, so the case where gamma is a cyclic group of order, just uh, roots of unity of order n, on the diagonal, so if gamma is z mod n, uh, then uh, the corresponding surface uh, c2 mod gamma is, you can think of, embedded into c3 uh, with coordinates x, y, z. Uh, and uh, the equation is, uh, I believe, x squared plus y squared plus z to the n plus 1 uh, is 0. So this is uh, what it is. And now the deformation is, uh, so, this, uh, so this is m naught bar. 
And then the, the corresponding deformation, m lambda, L naught, L C bar, is simply you write the same thing, x, y, z, a, c, 3. Uh, but now you deform the equation, namely you uh, keep the squares, uh, but add, instead of this monomial, you add an arbitrary polynomial with le this leading term. So you write uh, z to the n plus 1 plus a polynomial in z of degree uh, less than or equal to m. And this polynomial has uh, exactly this many parameters in it, so the coefficients. So this is the universal deformation of the surface. And uh, so if you resolve singularities, I will say about this uh, a little bit more in some time. But you will, uh, so that's what, what the picture is. Uh, uh, right. It, it, for the same reason as I explained, explained here, it, it, you, can, you put a one-dimensional vector space, but the equation actually imposes it to i and j to be 0. It was the same reason as here. So that's, uh, that's why Kronheimer didn't put this one-dimensional vector space. Uh, he didn't know Nakajima at that time. And Nakajima was probably, well, he was born probably, but not yet, maybe in high school. Uh, but uh, in any case, he didn't do that. But the effect is exactly the same. So, and that's the effect, well. Uh, all right. Uh, okay, so I will get to this. So now I want to discuss a little, so to proceed to the next step, I need to discuss tautological bundles on quiver varieties. So let me a little bit. Bundles. So, uh, right. Uh, well, uh, let me for a while keep the notation L, although now I'm talking about uh, an arbitrary quiver, uh, but just uh, instead of L, instead of V and W, I will write L and M. Uh, because later on I will apply this construction to that particular case, but so far it's, it's completely irrelevant. So we have a wrap of L M for an arbitrary quiver. So this is as usual of Q prime of Q prime bar for arbitrary quiver of Q. So we are looking at wrap Q prime bar for some vector spaces L and M. Okay. Now, what we observe is that, uh, well, we have an obvious trivial vector bundle. So for each vertex, for each vertex i in i, we have the vector space Li sitting at that vertex. And therefore, we have a trivial uh, vector bundle on wrap with this fiber. So nothing happens. OK, we can restrict it to, to any fiber of the moment map. Then, then we get uh, still a trivial vector bundle on this fiber of the moment map. And now, of course, uh, everything I am writing is invariant under the group of general linear group G sub L. Of. So this is a GL equivariant. And therefore, it induces a possibly non-trivial vector bundle on the, quo on the GIT quotient. So, and so this gives me a non-trivial bundle, which I now denote by uh, curly L uh, sub i. This is a, a non-trivial vector bundle on this quiver variety m lambda 
of uh, L M. So it still has rank equal to the dimension of this vector space. So rank uh, equal to the dimension of L i vector bundle. And this is called a tautological vector bundle associated to the vertex i because they come in a completely canonical weight. Now notice that uh, there are, so th we have one for each i, but they are related by completely canonical morphisms between them. Namely, if I have an edge, namely an arrow in our quiver, so if x is an arrow from i to j in q, or in maybe in q bar, uh, then uh, it gives me a, an absolutely canonical morphism between these vector bundles now i to lj. Because by the construction, it gives me a map from li to lj as vector spaces. And so for each, so in other words, a point in the base is a quadruple uh, uh, x, x star i and j. And at the, at the, at the, uh, on the fiber over that quadruple, it's the maps given by x uh, or x star. So there's a completely canonical maps. All right. So canonical morphisms. So now uh, here is the reason why I wanted to use L and M, because now let's look at representations of the same quiver in another pair of vector spaces, V and W. Okay, so now suppose we also have some V and W, and we now look at wrap of the same stuff, Q prime bar, but now in V and W. Okay. And now I construct uh, the following complex of length three, which is usually called a monad. So uh, I need a huge of, a lot of space for it. So let me zoom in here. So it looks like a huge gadget. So there are three terms. The first term, it's a direct sum over the vertices. And you do this, you take uh, each vector space vi, or maybe let's take with it. So you take the tautological bundle li and tensor it with a fixed vector space vi in our, so this is just, so the curly things are vector bundles and the straight ones are vector spaces. So this is the first term of the monad. So the second term, and there will be a map sigma here, or an amorphism of vector bundles. So this consists of two parts, each is a direct sum. The first part is over edges. Uh, so it's over edges from i to j. And this uh, goes as li tensor v sub j. Uh, this will be one part, and this will be, there will be also, so I write this term like that. Uh, and the second term will be again sum over edges, over vertices, and this is just Li tensor Wi. Mm -hmm. And the last term is uh, the same as the first one, it's sum over, uh, over vertices. Li tensor Vi, uh, yes. And the map here will be tall. And in some sense, uh, uh, this is what, what's going on here is that somehow uh, this part in a sort of, in some imprecise sense, an analog of the moment map, and this part is all transposed to it. So the whole diagram is a sort of self-dual. Uh, all right, so now I have to define the maps. Uh, so the map sigma, uh, so I first write it in symbols, and then uh, in symbols it's very easy. Uh, so it's one tensor little x uh, minus capital X tensor one, and then uh, one tensor j, and tau is... Uh, 
one tensor x little little x star uh, plus capital X star tensor one and one tensor i. Okay. Now, uh, what does it mean? Uh, so uh, the little axis and the little i and j is a point in my manifold in my curve variety. So uh, so this is a uh, so this uh, uh, sequence of vector bundles is so. Let me write it here. So this uh, this is a diagram of vector bundles on uh, this m lambda vw. And so to define these maps sigma and tau, I have to define the corresponding maps on the, of the fibers over a point little x, little x star, i and j. Okay. Now on the other hand, uh, I have canonical morphisms between the corresponding tautological bundles, and this is what I denote by capital letters. They're both associated to, to the same edges, but I have two types of maps. One's uh, the capital ones are between the canonical, uh, between the bundle, these are the bundle maps, while the little ones are just linear maps in the uh, between vector spaces. Okay? Well, and with this notation, everything is clear. So, uh, so this is a map, which is a map of vector spaces, and it doesn't touch the, the, uh, the bundle. And this is a map on the bundle, which doesn't touch the vector space, and on... Uh, uh, for the G, I and J, we only considered, I carefully didn't write, there are no canonical tautological maps between vector bundles, I just didn't consider them. Uh, you only have little one, I and little J, and that's what it is. And the miracle is, of course, that, uh, I don't know if I wrote it, so claim. Uh, so there, there are simple claims here. Uh, so, right, so I think this diagram makes sense in complete generality, uh, but let me make statements now in, uh, in the situation I want. Namely, now suppose that uh, our quiver is indeed uh, an affine drinking quiver. Well, maybe the first statement that definitely holds for in, a, in any generality, but maybe the other ones are not. So anyway, the only application I will do is this. Uh, so this is my quiver, uh, uh, and uh, right. And so uh, my L space is just what I discussed. So it's the collection of irreducibles. Uh, uh, wraps of my gamma, uh, and uh, M space is just one dimensional, as before. So the corresponding uh, quiver. Uh, uh, so this is the situation I discussed before. Uh, so this uh, M lambda LM is precisely this resolution of Kleinian singularity, which I considered. And so all my vector bundles and uh, these things are now vector bundles on this Kleinian, on this resolution. Okay. Uh, and so now the, the lemma is that, uh, first of all, this statement is completely general, is that actually uh, the composite of these two maps is zero. So tau composite sigma is zero. Second, uh, a stability condition. So this quadruple. So in the in. So stability. Of uh, this x x star little x x star i and j. Implies that uh, the last map is surjective. Uh, tau is surjective. And now uh, this is one point. Ah, I promised to make. Uh, yes. Uh, hmm. Okay, I will. Okay, so let me write down it first. So uh, as you, I said, that the diagram is completely symmetric. So you may wonder what, how to make sigma injective as opposed to tau surjective. And the answer is that you have to put the opposite stability condition. So, we, so far and everywhere, we use the stability, the product of the determinant. 
But if you replace it by the inverse of the product of the determinant, the stability gets changed. And that's where you see its change. And then the condition will be, I will say it, uh, costability, which means there's the opposite stability. Well, uh, maybe I should write the opposite stability. Uh, would, if you do the calculation, it implies that sigma is injective and no condition on tau. Okay. Uh, all right. And uh, so, uh, so in this situation, you have a morphisms of, uh, so we have morphisms of vector bundles from here to here, from here to here. The, the composite is zero, so it's natural to consider the cohomology in the middle. Uh, and this gives me a sheaf on, uh, on my variety. And so the proposition is that And this is the theorem of, well, in the differential geometric language, this is what Kronheimer and Nakajima proved. So maybe I should call it a theorem. Uh, Kronheimer. Uh, so uh, this gives me a map. Uh, so from e for each quadruple, uh, x, little x, little x star, i and j, it gives me a, a sheaf on, on my uh, resolution. And in fact, it says that, so that this gives me a map from this uh, quiver variety m lambda uh, vw. Uh, it's an isomorphism to the moduli space of torsion free, uh, free uh, coherent sheaves. Uh, on uh, C2, well, C2 mod gamma deformed to the parameter lambda. So I could write, uh, well, in more suggestive notation, I should say, so I put a tilde and then put lambda. So this means that I deform it, I mean, I take it, the corresponding point in the universal deformation corresponding to, so in, in my old notation, this, will, this was uh, M lambda of L C without a bar. So it's the resolution of the deformation. Okay? But uh, 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 this is not the whole, st uh, the, the, the end of this, uh, the statement because this is a non-compact variety. This is two. So you have to, in order to make things, to make sense of the right-hand side, you have to compactify it in some way. And so for this, you observe that uh, actually C2, all, all these gadgets, so it's con more convenient to now to write, use this notation, uh, you can embed C2 into P2, just to add the line at infinity. So let me write it, and I will not uh, say more about it. And so uh, you take those torsion-free sheaves, here and there, everything on C2, which are completely trivial on the line at infinity, and moreover, the trivialization is the space W, so such that uh, the restriction of such a sheaf coherent sheaves, let's say, f on this gadget, which extend to the boundary. And moreover, at the boundary, uh, so at this line at infinity, uh, infinity mod gamma, uh, on this line at infinity, they're just uh, w vector space uh, times the structure sheaf. And this isomorphism is fixed. So then it uh, the right-hand side gives a well-defined moduli sp space. And the claim is that this construction, which associates to i and i uh, to x, uh, x star, uh, i j, uh, the corresponding cohomology of the monad, so her tau mod m sigma, uh, is a one-to-one -one correspondence between these two things. So, in particular, this gives an interpretation of an arbitrary quiver variety for the for an affine Dinkin quiver. You can think of it geometrically as torsion-free sheaves on this Kleinian surface. So this is the best uh, thing. Right. So uh, now I have two things to say. Uh, so now I have to say, uh, yeah. Hmm? V is computed in a complicated way as some homo H1 of some sheath tensored with some power of O of something. So it's a complicated expression. 
There's no simple formula for V. You can look in Nakajima's book, and there is a cal this calculation for without a gamma, but it's the same. So W is very simple. It's just a fiber at infinity. But V is something complicated. Uh, all right. So now I, I had a, a so now I have to go to the standard applications of represent, to representation theory, namely to uh, uh, to the construction of representations using Nakajima varieties. Now, uh, since I have very little time, I will make a compromise, which I believe is reasonable. And in, uh, instead of uh, uh, explaining the, the standard construction, uh, which is kind of long and it involves a complex which looks very much as this one, and you can see it in Nakajima paper. I will explain in words a better construction, which is I don't think has any reference to it. It's written more or less the statement somewhere in uh, papers of Nakajima, but re oriented to physics audience somehow. Uh, and, but I don't think there's a written proof of what I'm going to say. Uh, and again, the, the advantage of uh, the standard construction is that it works for any quiver. But what I'm saying only makes sense for the affine blinking ones. But I think it may put some light into what's going on. So uh, now I remind you how actually this resolution of Kleinian singularity looks. Yeah, first of all, from now on, uh, we only take lambda equal to 0. So there will be no parameters whatsoever. So we already put chi to be 0, and now we put lambda to be 0. So, and then I write just m of vw, and there will be no parameters at all anywhere. OK, so, uh, so now we consider this uh, Kleinian singularity. So now our quiver is a q is, or rather, so we consider this q gamma, which is a AD type affine quiver. Okay, uh, and so uh, let me recall the structure of this uh, minimal resolution. So we have this minimal resolution. So, uh, so this is my map pi for our specific choice of dimensions given by this L i's. Uh, and so uh, I will recall how what is the geometry of this, uh, namely. So this is a resolution of single. So this this is a smooth surface everywhere except zero because that's the fixed point of gamma. And so uh, this resolution uh, does not change anything outside zero, and there's a special fiber at zero. And this special fiber, this is a classical thing. It's a tree of P1s. And the graph of this tree, na name which says which P1s intersects with which, is exactly the finite Dinkin diagram that comes by removing the not vertex from the affine Dinkin diagram. So for instance, for a type AN, this is just a bunch n copies of P1, so that the, each copy intersects the next one and the previous one and doesn't intersect anything else. So this is a P1, so and uh, the, with graph, with in graph uh, ADE without a tilde, so the, the finite graph. And the other information is that each P1, uh, each of these P1s, uh, in, as sitting inside this surface, has self-intersection negative 2. So P1 i times itself. Well, uh, the intersection graph of the, pre of the other ones is precisely the thinking graph. So they intersect transversely at these points. Uh, but each one intersects itself. Uh, uh, the index is negative 2. All right, so, uh, so I'm going now to define uh, for each i a correspondence between, uh, yes, so now for each i, yeah, so, so the p1s are labeled by vertices of the Dinkin diagram all except 0. 0 vertices doesn't play a role here. And uh, this is one of the disadvantages of the construction I'm explaining. Uh, so this is the set of vertices, minus 0. Uh, and so now I'm going to construct a correspondence uh, between, uh, which I'll denote by zi. So this is a correspondence between uh, the quiver variety with dimensions uh, vw for some v and w, and the quiver variety with dimensions where the dimension of w 
is increased by one at the ith coordinate and nothing else, and w is the same. So uh, v uh, plus a copy of c placed in, in at the vertex i and the same w. Uh, so I'll, exp uh, I'll define a smooth subvariety, in fact, a Lagrangian subvariety in this product. And geometrically, this is completely natural. Uh, and the construction is very simple. So I will use the identification with torsion-free sheaves. So a point in here is a torsion-free sheaf uh, F sitting uh, on this guy, and a torsion-free sheaf F prime sitting on this guy. So I, uh, I have to define, tell you, so this ZI consists of pairs F and F prime with certain conditions which defines me a sub-variety. And the condition is very simple, namely so let me uh, also, yeah, so I already had the notation. So my zi uh, is uh, the set of pairs f and f prime, uh, f, uh, f prime uh, such that the following holds uh, one is uh, a subsheaf in the other. Well, maybe I should write a, uh, an exact sequence. Probably that's the so they agree everywhere except the P one one of the P ones, uh, which is labeled has label I. And so the uh, one is subsheaf of the other, and the quotient is a sheaf on this P1, and uh, this, this is what, what it should be. Okay. So Nakajima, instead of, uh, so in his paper, instead of just defining it this way, he explains explicitly which pairs of quadruples x, x star, i, and j for both quivers you have to take. And this gives a complicated combinatorial thing, but on the surface of it, it's this. Okay? And now, since I have only five minutes, uh, I will just say, go to the library and read my book. Uh, <laughs> uh, so then uh, the story is more or less exactly the same as in my book. So namely, uh, the statement of theorem number one of uh, now. Yeah, so let me still introduce two notation. Uh, 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 which uh, I will use. Uh, so, so now let's consider, uh, so let G be the katz moody algebra associated to my quiver, uh, which is essentially, well, I, I discussed only AB type, but so this is the katz moody Uh, uh, corresponding to the Cartan matrix coming from uh, from uh, this quiver Q, uh, uh, and so it has uh, fundamental weights omega i uh, labeled by the same set of vertices, fundamental weights, uh, and it has simple roots. And here I have to uh, use a non-conventional notation because I wrongly used an, uh, alphas for something else. So these are simple roots. And now the, uh, the rule is as follows. If I have a, a tuple of uh, lambdas, which was, uh, so if I have a, a tuple of integers, lambda i, uh, i and i, so this is in z to the i, I think of it as a weight uh, corresponding to so I also write lambda for some lambda i omega i. And if I write something which has alpha in it as opposed to lambda, it's still an integer i tuple. But then I write, I think of it as a alpha, which is the sum of alpha i a i, and think of it as a sum of simple roots as opposed to fundamental weights.
Well, and then uh, basically, uh, so maybe uh, to, to, since I want still to go to this interesting thing that I want to discuss, uh, I, I will be rather weak here because it's exactly the same story as in my book. So Nakajima just proves two theorems. One theorem says that, uh, theorem number one says uh, that there exists a natural map from the universal enveloping algebra of this katz moody algebra G uh, to the uh, uh, Taub homology, uh, maybe Taub Borel Moore homology, uh, uh, of this varieties uh, of, of, let me write it down, of, of this kind of standard variety. So you take M cross M over M bar uh, for all uh, V's and uh, fixed W. Well, let me uh, say it. And part number two, uh, so this is one, and part number two. If we denote by lambda uh, uh, the zero fiber uh, of the morphism uh, from uh, M uh, VW uh, to M bar VW, uh, and I take uh, I take the dimension vector of W to be uh, lambda, uh, yes, lambda. So it's an i-tuple, which I think of it as a weight. And I take the dimension vector of V uh, to be alpha. Uh, then the statement is that uh, uh, this algebra, uh, so let's call this variety Z. And then uh, uh, the statement number two is that uh, the homology uh, of lambda, so of the union of lambda, uh, so this is lambda depending on v and w. So if I fix w but don't fix v, so this joint union over v's of lambda w, uh, v w, uh, so this is a module over the homology of this, and this module is an irreducible finite dimensional representation of u of g, so e rep of u of g uh, with highest weight uh, lambda. And each individual v gives precisely the weight. So it's u rep of g. I will take two more, or three more minutes, OK? Because I want to say conjecture. So is an E-rep uh, e of G with highest weight weight uh, lambda and each individual uh, H lambda WV uh, corresponds to the weight space weight space but not a weight alpha, as you might exp uh, think, which is uh, completely makes no sense. But a weight, uh, uh, a weight uh, lambda minus alpha, because uh, of course uh, all the weights in a representation with highest weight alpha lambda have a form lambda minus some combination of roots, uh, and so that's what natural to do. Okay. So now uh, comes the part that I wanted to say. This is this conjectural. So there's a puzzle here, which is a very serious puzzle. And uh, we actually had a, so let me uh, first write down and then. So the puzzle is this, that there are basically, nowadays, two completely different constructions of irreducible repre finite dimensional representations of G. Uh, one construction is the Nakajima construction. So if we have a finite dimensional irreducible representation, you wrap. then there are two ways to cook it up from geometry. One way is the way of Nakajima, which I just described. And the other way is uh, a geometric satake construction, which takes the affine Grossmannian, and uh, so it takes IC sheaves on that Grossmannian. And so in some homolog homology, you get also a finite dimensional, uh, the same finite dimensional satake. So of course the puzzle is, is there any 
connection between these two constructions, which is a challenging thing. Now, there's a name for this question, and we disagreed with David how one should. Uh, so, I so the mathematical name is due to uh, Braden, Licata, uh, Profrut, and uh, who else? This Webster, yes. So I won't write this down. So this is called, uh, going from here to here, mathematically, is called uh, symplectic duality. But it's not known what it is. It's just a name. OK. Now, I thought that it's called uh, uh, also three-dimensional mirror symmetry, but David objected. And then today in the morning, I figured how I can reconcile with him. Let's call it Gaiotto duality. And then I think he won't be able to, because nobody knows what this Gaiotto duality is. <laughs> so OK, so anyway, what I want to say is uh, it's a work in progress. I want to, I won't, I, I'm unable to prove, uh, to say anything about this particular problem. But I want to explain you a conjectural link between at least what Nakajima does and what uh, geometric Sataki does. OK, that's what I'm going to discuss. Just, OK, so, so I will, since uh, I'm completely in negative time, uh, uh, I'll just draw a picture of various objects, and uh, this will be it. So. Uh, for each, so there will be a lambda and an alpha, as before. And uh, alpha will come into, let me come with a side which, is not, which was not present. So there's something called Zastava space. And since Ivan is here, I, uh, probably. Uh, so this is the Zastava space corresponding to alpha. Uh, there is also an alpha. And we just cross it with. Uh, what is denoted by a? Uh, there's also a lambda, and we cross it with this. So lambda is a tuple of lambda i's, and for each lambda i, we take a symmetric power of the corresponding a1. So which is usually people in this business call it a, a color divisor, which is what it is, of uh, degree of lambda. Uh, okay, and so now this maps to. Uh, I keep this as is, uh, and now there's a star space is known to map to a similar thing with alpha instead of lambda. So there's a standard map, which is a, well, no, no it's a generic, it's a Lagrangian vibration. So anyway, this is the picture. Uh, now, on the other hand, I want to produce a totally different map related to Nakajima variety. Uh, namely, do the following. You consider my representations of quiver, uh, of like my, this Q prime bar, whatever. Uh, with dimension vectors, uh, with vector spaces W and V and W with the same convention as before. So this has, V has dimension uh, lam uh, alpha and W, this is alpha and this is lambda as before. Uh, now remember this has a moment map to GV, but now I do take GW. So we take GV cross GW. Now also I previously identified G all the other with their duals, but let's not do that. Uh, so, uh, but then what is the moment map? It's a map from here to the dual of that. But now let's think of it uh, as a function on this space, which is linear along these factors. So there's a function on this space. Uh, let's call it uh, phi. And uh, I'll call it a master function. So it's a function on this. Okay. And now let's do the following. Uh, let's project just to this. And moreover, let's take uh, the adjoint quotient. So we project uh, GV to its quotient mod, the adjoint action. And if you see, I mean, this is the Cartan mod W, and this is precisely the same space as here. So, and so the, the V's one give me uh, the A alphas, and the W ones give me A lambdas. So this is adjoint quotient. So now give me the, give some names. So let's call it, uh, well, I don't know. Let's call this map P1. P. So let's this be P1 and this be P2, OK? So now, uh, suppose I have an irrational number. So what I'm, yes. So on this, yeah, I'm on this side. So on this side, uh, Gates-Gory constructed a certain D module on here. 
uh, for each irrational number in his uh, construction of Whitaker in his attempt to deform geometric Hataki to the quantum group case. So there's a, some Whitaker D module or traverse sheaf, I don't know. Uh, so let's call it G, the gaze gory sheaf. Well, maybe W for Whitaker. Uh, traverse sheaf. Uh, and, and one can take its direct image uh, under the map P1, shriek direct image, uh, to the base. Uh, this has been studied actually in a very recent paper by uh, Braverman, uh, Dobrovolska, and uh, Finkelberg, just maybe two months ago, a month ago. They write down this sheaf explicitly. On the other hand, you can do the following thing. On this space, on at least on a, on a uh, generic locus where everything uh, is okay, uh, you can consider, you ra can raise my master function f, phi, to the complex power c. So this gives a rank one local system on, with monodromy this, on the generic part where phi is not zero. And now you take uh, its pi two push forward to the same thing. And the claim is that they are equal. Uh, so this is one hint. I'm not saying this has to solve the problem or it's really a uh, notice that, well, uh, anyway. So this at least is one hint where uh, the two sides give something related to each other. Okay. okay, thank you. I'm sorry I'm late.